Oh hey, didn't see you there. Come on in. Let me show you the studio. Here we have Plague Studios, where we're working hard away at Project Jackal, our major game project. Here are all our members, flat out working, getting hard at it. Let me introduce you to some of those members. Come on over. Hey Dave, how are you getting on? I'm acting great. This is great. Dave Backenberry. He's working on all the spooky monsters for our game, you know, the rars. Uh, I'll let him talk about it. Take it away, Dave. All right. I'm the creature designer here at Plague Studios. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna show you what I do here. All right, I'm gonna take you guys through my process and what exactly a character artist does in games. A character artist's main responsibilities for games are making clothes for characters, fixing scans of real people to make them fit the game, and, if you're really lucky, working on creatures and characters. Luckily for me, in this project, I'm working on creatures and characters. There are two ways to go about a sculpt. You can start a sculpt from a 2D concept, or you can start a sculpt by basically just going in there and starting to sculpt. We call it that concept sculpting. Um, I prefer concept sculpting. I find that 2D characters don't quite work out the way you think they will in the 3D space. Let's talk about the process of bringing the concept idea from not into a fully done sculpt. Firstly, start with a rough base of a sculpt. Use Z-spheres and a clay build-up brush to build up the base for the mesh. Don't worry about smoothing the mesh at all at this stage. It's really not worth it. Next we need to define the bony parts of the mesh. Watch the area around the clavicle and how it bends slightly to take on the load of the body. After this we can start on the muscles, paying special attention to how the muscles from the pectoral muscle join into the deltoids. Don't worry about smoothing the mesh at this stage, it's just not really not worth it again. Um, just use the clay build up brush and just keep adding on muscles until you get it right and taken away as well don't forget that next and nearly the final stage is adding the fat this now you can smooth smooth in the fat preferably brush against the grain to add in extra bit of shape and volume there remember that real life tins actually have more fat than you think like nothing has 100 percent muscle no matter what you may think tins look like and lastly just add the details to your sculpt then you have a sculpt, and that's done. Bottles. <laughs> Sup, my dudes, and on to our next team member, Maeve David. This isn't actually where she belongs in our studio, but she's here anyway, so we'll have to make do with that. Does she cook? No, but okay. Maeve, want to introduce yourself to the people at this home? Not your home, our home. It's some home. Sure. My name is Maeve, and I am the animator. Want to show them the work you're working on? Of course. Let's have a look! An animator is a creator of movement and personality within the game. They give spirit to what would otherwise be a lifeless game. For Project Jackal, these are the steps in which I took to achieve a result. I will be taking you through the animation pipeline in regards to characters. This will be a breakdown of three stages. Rigging, animation and implementation. As a rigger, I need three different types of rigs to be made. A mocap skeleton is the bare bones of an animation rig. This is done because Motion Builder has its own rig setup, which is automatically applied. An animation rig is a bit more complex. In creating a rig, a set of controls and sliders are created for the animator, so that the animator can achieve a more natural looking movement through hand animation. A game skeleton is a real-time skeleton that transfers the animation data to engine. This skeleton is used to create limb colliders and ragdoll physics. This allows the player to interact with the character. When it comes to hand animation, we use Maya. This is a superior software for hand animation. As an animator, there is multiple different steps that must be taken. Key poses. Key poses is the blocking out of animations to make sure the timing is correct in its most basic form. Then transitions are added to give a flow from one key pose to another. Once the animations are cleaned up, then they can be exported to engine. The primary software to read and edit mocap data is Motion Builder. This allows pre-made motion captured animations to drive the skeleton. 
as it is only data, it needs to be cleaned, and some personality given to the animation. This is done through different methods, cutting the animation to suit the speed of the character, using the layer system for the creation of extreme poses, fixing any information in the animation using the F-curve. For implementation, an animation gym is created. This contains all the working mechanics from the game as well as the animations. We do this as it is the most ideal environment to test our animations. We then implement the game skeleton and animation. The animation controller is set up to carry out the animations when called. The controller allows for the character's logic. We can now begin to test the animations in a game environment. This gives a better idea of what animations are needed and might not work with the character's movements. And that's my pipeline as an animator. Um, and thank you for listening. Oh hey, welcome back. Let me introduce you to the next team member. Hey friend. Would you like to introduce yourself to the people at home? Hi, I'm Troy, and I'm the environment artist at Blake Studio. Let me show you what I'm working on. Cool! An environment artist creates environments in which the player can explore. We are storytellers, philosophers, architects, most of all humans. As an environment artist, our one goal is to draw out an emotion from the player by telling them a story. In this breakdown, I'm going to show you how we are going to go about creating a dynamic environment that tells a story. First of all, we want to break down the story that we want to tell the player. Where is the player? What is the player doing? Where is the player looking for? Where did the player come from? These are a few of the endless amount of questions that you must ask yourself as an environment artist. Once we have broken down the story that we want to tell the player, we must start planning out the area. When planning out the area, we want to keep all the answers to the story questions in our mind. We make a list of what props we will need for the area, what textures, and where our light source will be based on these answers. In environment art, there is a lot of planning as it's difficult to express a story through an environment without it. After we have completed the planning stage, we can move on to creating the assets. There are three types of assets that can be created for an environment. Materials, Structure Geo, and Props. Materials are a seamless set of textures in which you use to texture large surfaces that otherwise would be low resolution. Structure Geo is Geo in which are the large surfaces. And props are small assets that can be textured by normal means. I create these using a number of programs including Maya, Substance, Photoshop and ZBrush. While creating these assets, you want to keep in mind one very important technique, modularity. This means instead of creating a whole environment, create a series of building blocks to swap in and out to create a dynamic environment. Think of it as building a very expensive Lego block. This is the key to creating large environments. This technique saves you a lot of time and is crucial in the industry as you need to enable others to create the levels and not create them yourself. After we have finished our assets, we bring them into Engine, in this case Unity. When brought into Unity, we will set up the materials and props. We then prefab them out before building our own environment. When building our environment, we want to stay away from repetition. This will break the immersion of the level and prevent us from drawing that emotion out of the player. This is where the storytelling skills of the artist come into play. The goal is to set up the pieces in a way that will tell or aid in telling the player something about the game. An environment artist will go through these processes, tweaking, adding and removing assets. Games like Skyrim, The Order 1886, and Gears of War are prime examples of amazing environment art. All these games have one thing in common. They are immersive and rich in storytelling. <laughs> okay, go. Now I'm going to introduce you to the backbone of this team, the key member of this team, the foundation of this team. Take it away. Thanks, Dad. It's nice to be appreciated. Here. Hi, guys. Let me show you what I'm working on. You know, this team works with or without me. I mean, just with me, just with me. Come on, we'll, we'll work with. Plan for creating effects. Example, this blood effect here. I would begin by gathering research and reference imagery, as shown here. And then I would look at one of the images and break it down into its simplest parts. Example, the volume of blood, there's a heavy amount there. The fine red mist, 
the directional blood and then extra blood spots or splatter. Then I would begin to create those effects in the programs such as Houdini, After Effects and Photoshop. The blood volume, for example, I created in Photoshop and brought it over to After Effects. Once in After Effects, I can add fractional noise and dissolve effect onto it and have them change over time. And if I set this to 16 frames, it would render out 16 PNG sequence imagery that I could use as a sprite sheet. Once I have that, that imagery brought over to Unity, I can change the values in the editor to give me my desired effect. For example, have the duration, the direction, the size, and the emission detail. I would have done this for the directional blood as well. As for the blood splatter, I would have just created that in Photoshop as a simple shape and add a motion blur to make it look like it's moving right. For the blood mist or smoke, I created that in Houdini. For my 3D creation pipeline, for example this bomb here, I would begin by gathering research imagery and creating a mood board with different reference on it and determine what looks well and what doesn't look well. Originally I created a placeholder model with this kind of dynamite stick layout. It didn't quite work well in game so I ended up going with this layout. Here you can see my low poly and my high poly. I begin by creating a mid poly and seeing if it's the right shape and form. Once I have my mid poly correct I add extra topology to create my high poly and then put a turbo smooth on top of that to give it that extra detail and smoothness. I then create a duplicate of my high poly and start taking away as much topology as I can without wrecking the form and shape of the object. This will give me my low poly. Then I can use my UV unwrap to unwrap the, the object and lay out the UV islands as so. Once I have those both ready, I can export them to Substance where I can apply the materials and effects to give them that in-game world look and feel. And now on to our last member of Play Studios team, Tom. Wanna introduce yourself to the people, Tom? Let them know how you're getting on. Hello, my name is Tom. I am a programmer at Unity. Do you want to show them some of your work, Tom? You should, Tom. Let's have a look. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go over how I like to do things. So I've created a series of template scripts that derive from other behavior, just allow for own, my own execution of them without having to run from Unity's overhead. So for example I have a deep manager and basically within that I can add scripts to a list that will be executed as I please without having to overhead adopt the input chain. It also gives me much easier control over the script execution order as you can see here. I can move things around boom boom. Um, another key aspect of the game is we've set up a modular event system that allows designers to plug logic in to world interactions using scriptable events, which are simply just scriptable objects designers can create based off pre existing logic that operates the execute function. Um, another big thing in the game going on is the objective manager. The objective manager is a series of systems that uh, allow the designer to plug and play what kind of missions he'd like to have in the level. So, for example, choose to have either just the rescue mission or I can add a defense mission and delivery mission and then with this if the designer drops the right the component prefabs into the scene it'll pick them up automatically and add them to the list and do all the necessary setup for this um, what else do we have going on? so the other thing I like to do is break my variables into public scriptable objects for stuff that can be reused and make it more formal for the designer to access. So for example, this is a scriptable string. So let's give an example. It's just a simple resource. And you type in values and then you can drag and drop them wherever you might need them. And uh, that's it for me. Bye guys. Thank you for watching the Plague Studio Tour. We hope you enjoyed. From everyone here at the studio, we'd like to say goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>